All right, we're going to finish up this chapter talking about Taylor and McLaurin series. Um, in section seven, we looked at Taylor and McLaurin polynomials. Those were finite degree polynomials that we would use to approximate a function um, at and around a chosen center. Um, and in uh, the last couple sections, we worked with power series. And now we can create a power series maybe to represent a function. And we kind of focus in the last section on those geometric power series. Um, in, this, uh, in this section, we're going to just extend those Taylor and McLaurin polynomials to make a whole series, right? So an infinite degree polynomial where we get the coefficient for the nth term uh, by using this formula. This should look familiar. We evaluate the nth derivative at the center, divide by n factorial. Um, to get the coefficient on uh, x minus c to the n. Um, so we're going to start by working on it, on this example. We're going to find the Maclaurin series for sine x. So again, Maclaurin series means we have our center is 0, so we're going to have powers of x. Um, and, you know, when we were working with um, the Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials, those finite degree polynomials, we knew exactly how many derivatives to find. Here, we're going to try to make an infinite degree polynomial. So as we find derivatives, actually part of our strategy is going to be to try to recognize a pattern um, so we know what the nth derivative will be when we evaluate it at the center. So um, in this function, uh, I'm going to go through this. Um, this will maybe a little bit quickly. We've already done a lot of this because we made a 7th degree Maclaurin polynomial for sine um, back in section 7. So our function is sine x. If we plug in 0, we get 0. Our first derivative is cosine x. And if we evaluate that at 0, we get 1. Our second derivative is negative sine x. Evaluating that at 0, we get 0. Our third derivative is negative cosine x. If we evaluate that at 0, we get negative 1. And we'd already observed this back in section 7, but this pattern repeats, right? If as soon as I take the fourth derivative, I'm back to positive sine x, and evaluating that at 0 gives me 0. So this pattern. repeats. And so we can make a couple of observations. Um, we're only going to have odd powers of x, right? The even derivatives are all 0. So we're only going to have odd powers of x. And um, it's alternating on those odd powers. So it's, we'll get 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. So putting this together. Let's see. So we start with f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared. I'm just putting in um, you know, how we put this together based on uh, the theorem 31 here. So we know that the even powers, those are all 0. And we know that um, 
see the first derivative is 1, the third derivative is negative 1, the fifth derivative is positive 1, and so on, right? The seventh derivative will be negative 1. So what we have here is 1 times x, and then minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. We could keep going, right? We kind of have established a pattern now. Minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the 7th, plus 1 over 9 factorial x to the 9th, and so on. So we can now write the series. So we know that we have just odd powers, and it's alternating. Um, so it's alternating. That part's easier to take care of. Uh, it'll kind of take care of that right off. So if it's alternating, it's either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1 uh, factor. And because we're starting out with a positive term, negative 1 to the n will work because we're starting at n equals 0. And we only have odd powers. So an odd is of the form 2n plus 1. and then we're dividing by that same odd factorial. So this is the series. Now um, the next thing we want to do now that we have a power series, a, a Maclaurin series for sine x, is get the uh, radius of convergence. And so for that we're going to use the ratio test. So the nth term is negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Um, the n plus 1 term. Okay, so if we replace n with, with n plus 1, then this is 2 times n plus 1 plus 1. And simplifying that gives us x to the 2n plus 3 over 2n plus 3 factorial. All right, so now let's put this together with the ratio test. We want the limit as n approaches infinity of un plus 1 over u sub n. multiply by the reciprocal now I'm going to rewrite a couple of things um, um, let's see so I'm going to uh, ignore the, the powers of negative 1. It's inside absolute value signs, so the presence of those factors of negative 1 uh, is not going to make a difference on the limit because it's all just going to be positive. x to the 2n plus 3, well, that's the same as x to the 2n plus 1 times x squared. And We were 2n plus 1 factorial. In the bottom, 2n plus 3 factorial, well, that's 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 factorial. And then we have our x to the 2n plus 1. So now it's sort of easier to see exactly what cancels. The x to the 2n plus 1s are gone. The 2n plus 1 factorial cancels. Oops. So it's x squared over 2n plus 3 over 2n plus 2. 
And you know, remember when we were finding these, uh, you know, the the um, radius of convergence and other problems. You know, we're, this is a limit as n approaches infinity, and we're considering this for some fixed non-zero value of x. So we could treat x like it's just some constant, um, and that means we can kind of pull this x squared out. Um, usually we need to be concerned about retaining the absolute value. If we pull out a constant, it's the absolute value of that constant. x squared is always positive, though, so I'm gonna, I don't really need to worry about the... Um, uh, about the uh, absolute values in this case. And 1 over 2n plus 3, 2n plus 2, that's always going to be positive. We're looking at this as n approaches infinity, so we've got positive values of n for sure. Now this limit right here, this limit for sure, is zero, right? Like that's approaching zeros and gets huge. And then we're multiplying that by some fixed but arbitrary value of x. No matter what the al value of x is, you know, we're going to take that x squared and multiply it by zero. So this whole limit is zero. And zero is always less than one. And that means that the radius of convergence is infinite. So the interval of convergence is all real numbers, minus infinity to infinity. So that's our interval of convergence for the series up here. So we would say that sine x is equal to this on this interval, on for all real numbers. So um, on the next page, we just have some general guidelines here uh, for finding a Taylor series. And it's what we basically did for um, the sine x function uh, in the last example. So you want to take a bunch of derivatives, you know, differentiate your function several times, and um, evaluate each derivative at the center, and then try to recognize a pattern for the numbers, right? We want to be able to write a formula with n for, like, what that coefficient, the nth coefficient is going to be. Um, and then we use that to make our, our coefficients, right? It, we're, we're trying to observe a pattern for these values, the nth derivative, right, evaluated at c. Then we use that formula to put this together and say, okay, here's our series. Now, the last step, um, this says with this interval of convergence, right, so in the last one we found it had an infinite radius, so it converged on all real numbers. Um, it says, with this interval of convergence, determine whether the series converges to f of x. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Usually, the best we can do, right, is is figure out if a series converges or not, right? And there's a lot of tests to run, and sometimes it's not obvious, but we can, you know, we've worked a bunch on being able to figure out what a series converges to. Uh, or, sorry, we've done a lot of work to figure out if a series converges, right, we, to build our tools and have all these convergence tests. Usually, we don't know what it converges to, right, unless our series is like telescoping or geometric. Most of the time, we just say it converges. We're not exactly sure what it converges to. We could approximate it by taking a bunch of terms. Um, now, in this case, we're trying to make a series to represent a function, and it's not just a geometric series where I can say, oh, a over 1 minus r, so I know what it converges to. Um, so determining that your series converges to a particular function can be a little bit of work. And Taylor's theorem says that, say this function, right, that we're trying to model, and you put together your, uh, your series. Now, what Taylor's theorem says is, if I stop at the nth term, right, like the nth polynomial, so it's not a series anymore, that that's an approximation, but it is, in fact, exactly equal to um, the function if I add on this remainder term. That just acknowledges I'm going to be off by a bit. So it's equal to this nth polynomial plus some remainder. Now, this remainder term is, of course, a function of x, meaning the amount that you're off by could vary depending on what um, value of x you plug in. And that kind of makes sense when we were 
graphing some of the Taylor polynomials, we could see that, you know, as we strayed further away, maybe that, re you know, we, our error was greater. Um, now, Taylor's theorem says that this remainder term is given by the following. So it's like you take the n plus 1 term, right? Like, it's sort of like just take the next term, but it's given by this value. So here's the big change. We're evaluating the n plus first derivative at some value z, where z just lies between x and c. Um, now, if we can show that our, um, or if we want to show that our function, if we're trying to show that our function, our series converges to our function, what we want to show is that this remainder term shrinks to zero for all x in the interval of convergence. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you're probably not going to need to do this a whole lot, but I'm going to show you how it works with a sine function um, that we that we just uh, found the, the series for in the last example. So if we want to show that the Maclaurin series converges to sine of x, then we will show... that the remainder term approaches zero as n approaches infinity for all real numbers. For all, you know, that the, the um, interval of convergence was all real numbers. So we're, we're going to show that this is true no matter what value of x we pick. So, okay, the nth, you know, the, the remainder term, Rn, according to Taylor's theorem, says that it takes on this form now um, we're working, you know, our function is sine x, right, that's our f of x and so we know that as I keep taking derivatives, whatever that n plus 1 derivative is, we know it's going to be either plus or minus sine or plus or minus cosine. Those are the only options. And here's the great thing about these functions, plus or minus sine and plus or minus cosine. These are all bounded, meaning that no matter what value, you know, z takes on in this remainder term, we know that the absolute value of the n plus 1 derivative evaluated at whatever value z that we might have, that this is less than 1, or I guess less than or equal to 1, for all z in the real numbers. Okay, so let's see where that gets us. So this remainder term certainly is at least as big as zero um, is equal to this thing right here. And we know, we just observed, that this, that is less than or equal to 1. So at, at, at its biggest, if that is in fact equal to 1, then this is 1 over n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1, which is absolute x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So notice here, um, 
we have this sort of bounded, right? So this remainder term is at least as big as zero, that's equal to this. Then I switch to a less than or equal to because I know that that's bounded, right? So this whole remainder term is less than or equal to x to the n plus one, the absolute value of x to the n plus one, over n plus one factorial. So now let's evaluate a limit. So the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth remainder term is the limit as n approaches infinity of absolute x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So now we're doing this for some fixed non-value 0 of x. So whatever this value is, it's something that's fixed. And then we're letting n grow arbitrarily large. We have this n plus 1 factorial in the bottom. We know Oh, wait, hold on a second. Let me, let me, I misspoke here. X is fixed, right? Um, so this part here, that's fixed. So we have some fixed base raised to the n plus one power. So obviously that to the n plus one, the whole numerator is not fixed. However, we showed a while back that exponential growth is sort of dwarfed by uh, factorial growth, right? We know that the bottom um, is growing so, so much more fast than the top, no matter what our base it is. So for each fixed x, this limit is equal to zero. So we have shown that that remainder term approaches zero, and that means that this series we found converges to sine of x. On all real numbers. So that took a little bit of doing, right? We kind of had to observe some things about the derivative. Uh, you know, we got we get kind of lucky with sines and cosines um, because we know that that when we evaluate the nth derivative, that's bounded. So if you found a series for cosine, you could show that that series converges to cosine uh, by doing basically the same thing and using those same ideas here. Um, what we're going to focus on um, for the rest of this section is just finding different series. Um, and sometimes we'll need to do the work to kind of find the coefficients and observe that pattern. Sometimes we'll be able to use work that we've already done um, and just make adjustments to a series to get a series for a new function. So in the next example, it says Maclaurin series for a composite function. So we want to find a Maclaurin series for sine of x squared. So x squared is the argument. So you know, we could just observe that, look, if, if uh, say, g of x is equal to sine x, right, just the, the, the function that we already found a series for, then our function f of x is g of x squared. So I could take the series that we already found for g of x and just plug in, um, uh, you know, x squared for x. So sine of x squared is equal to So it's alternating negative 1 to the n, then we're going to have x squared in for x. And then we just want to um, simplify.
So multiplying those exponents, we get x to the 4n plus 2. There's our series. All right. Um, so the next one, we're going to find a series for 1 plus x to the k. So here, uh, k is some fixed number. Um, so we're going to find a Maclaurin series for a function that looks like this. We call it a binomial function because we have two terms inside that we're raising to a power. Um, and uh, so let's get started. Um, we're not going to fix an actual value for k, but we're, we're going to know that it's just a constant. So we still are going to be able to do all the derivatives, um, uh, knowing and treating k like a constant. So our function f of x is... 1 plus x to the k power. Our first derivative. This is a power rule derivative, so k times 1 plus x to the k minus 1. Just keep taking derivatives. The second derivative is k times k minus 1 times 1 plus x to the k minus 2. The third derivative is k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times 1 plus x to the k minus 3. We're probably seeing a pattern here where we just keep picking up new, you know, more um, factors in front, right? The next, the fourth derivative will be k k minus 1, k minus 2, k minus 3, times 1 plus x to the k minus 4. So let's try to observe a pattern here and see if we can't figure out what does the nth derivative look like. So we know we're going to start. We've got these factors in front, right? k, k minus 1, k minus 2 all the way down to, and then what's our last factor, and what's our power on x, our power on 1 plus x. So a um, couple things to note here. The fourth derivative, you know, our power is k minus 4. The third derivative, our power is k minus 3. So for the nth derivative, our power is k minus n, and then um, we're going to subtract Let's see, we have one less, k minus, you know, one less power, right? Um, that, that was sort of an awkward way to phrase it, but um, let's see, that'll be k minus n plus 1 will be our last factor. All right, so now if we evaluate all of these at 0, because it is a Maclaurin polynomial, f of 0 is 1, f prime of 0, that's k, f double prime of 0 is k times k minus 1. Right, when we plug in x equals 0, the, this part here is just 1. So when we plug in 0, we just get the product uh, out in front. Third derivative is k, k minus 1, k minus 3, or sorry, k minus 2. Let me come all the way down here. The nth derivative is k, k minus 1, k minus 2 all the way down to k minus n plus 1. Now there's another way you can write that product. Uh, if you don't like writing, you know, the dot, 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 
Uh, there's a more um, kind of prescriptive way, kind of direct way to write it. Um, and that is, so we, we start with K, right? And then we're multiplying all the way down. Um, if K were an integer, um, a simpler way to write this would be K factorial over K minus N factorial. Um, so if K factorial would, would include all the factors all the way down to one, um, and then we cancel out the rest of the factors by dividing by K minus N factorial. Um, it's important to note that, you know, when we, when we define these factorials, really those are for positive whole numbers. Um, so, and, and most of the time when we make a series, it's because that power, that value of K is a fraction. So, it, you know, for usability purposes, we'll probably use that um, form of writing the, in, within the, co inside the coefficient. Um, so uh, let's see what we get. Um, we know what our nth derivative looks like, so I think we could put together the series. So it's the nth derivative evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. And this part here is what we have up there. So this is what we've got for a series. Now we want to determine what the radius of convergence is. Maybe the interval of convergence. So the radius of convergence we're going to set up our ratio test. So u sub n, um, let's see, I think for the purposes of setting up this ratio test, I'm going to use this form for that nth derivative, which means our um, nth term is going to look like k factorial over k minus n factorial and then n factorial. That n factorial on the bottom comes from right there. And that's x to the n. And then the n plus 1 term. Let's see, if I replace n with n plus 1, then k minus n plus 1 is k minus n minus 1, and then n plus 1 factorial, x to the n plus 1. All right, so we start with the n plus 1 term. And then reciprocal of the nth term. Okay, now we're going to do a lot of canceling. Uh, factorials are great in fractions. We get a lot of things to cancel. Um, also those powers of x. So I'm going to rewrite some stuff here, just to make it a little simpler. So we got k factorial, well, let's see. First, I'm just going to cancel the k factorial. That seems simple. Also, the x to the n will cancel and leave me with just a plain old x. So I've got an x on top. 
Now what uh, the next thing we've got is, uh, let's see, k minus n factorial is equal to k minus n times k minus n minus 1 factorial. And we have this n factorial. And then on the bottom, we have k minus n minus 1 factorial times n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. Now let's cancel this factorial with that one, this factorial with that one. And I'm going to take this factor of x outside, bring it out, it'll be a absolute value. So absolute value of x times the limit as n approaches infinity. Here now I really do need to keep the absolute values because we're not sure what uh, k is. Um, you know, k could be any arbitrary constant. So just we get a k minus n on top. And on the bottom we have n plus 1. Now as n gets huge, this takes on the form um, infinity over infinity, but if we just multiply the top and the bottom, by 1 over n, now we get k over n minus 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. k over n for any fixed k, that approaches 0. 1 over n, that approaches 0. So this whole limit is 1 and then you know we multiply that by the absolute value of x so we get absolute value of x and so we need the absolute value of x to be less than one if we're going to get convergence the ratio test says that this is less than one which means our radius of convergence is equal to one so for sure for any value of k we know that um, this series that we have up here i'm going to scroll up again to our series that we wrote out um, so we said 1 plus x to the k is equal to this series, and now we know that we get convergence on the open interval from minus 1 to 1. Um, it's possible you could get convergence at the endpoints, maybe depending on the value of k, but we know we get convergence on the open interval. Okay, so we just did a lot of work to find that um, binomial uh, expansion, that binomial series. So, you know, sometimes in some of the exercises you'll see, you know, it'll say use the definition to create um, a Taylor series. So they mean like kind of going through this process and finding all the derivatives. And sometimes they say use one of the series that you've already made or that we've made in this section to create a new series. In the text, it'll refer you to a table on a page um, in the text uh, where it gives you the Taylor series for a bunch of well-known functions, um, and you can use that function to create a new series. Kind of like we did for this problem, right? We just use this series that we made for sine to get a series for sine of x squared. Um, in the next example, uh, we're going to do a similar thing. Find a power series for f of x equals cosine of the square root of x. Well, um, if you look at that table uh, on the text, which I don't know what page it's on, uh, but it's in this uh, section of the text, I think section 10 of this chapter on um, infinite series. Um, if we look in that table, there is a series for cosine that looks like this. It is also alternating, only for this one we have uh, even powers of x. And so if we want a series for cosine of the square root of x, we're going to replace x with the square root of x.
And now we're just going to simplify. So if I take the square root of x and I raise that to the 2n power, that'll be the square root of x squared, and then raise that to the n power. So that'll actually be x to the n. All right, so that wasn't uh, too much work. So if we're, if we're um, you know, I guess, I guess the problems that have the most work are when we need to kind of use the derivatives and, and find the pattern ourselves. Um, but if we can reap the, the fruits of our past labor or use the results in, in the table, so you can come up with a, with a series without, uh, without too much work. Um, this next example says, find the power series for f of x equals um, the cube root of 1 plus x. So we can actually use some of the work we've already done. This is binomial, right? This is um, 1 plus x to the 1 third. So this is binomial where k is equal to a third. So going back to get the series that we built a couple of pages ago. Um, 1 plus x to the k is this series here. So k, k minus 1, k minus 2, down to k minus n plus 1, all over n factorial x to the n. So for us, k is equal to a third. Um, now what I'm going to do is just write out the first few terms here um, uh, with the, the 1 plus x to the k. So when n is 0, the we just get the constant term 1. When n is 1, then we have 1, uh, then we have, uh, sorry, k over 1 times x to the first. And then when n is 2, we have k, k minus 2 over 2 factorial x squared. When n is 3, ah, in the, sorry, when, k, when n is 2, we have k, k minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. Then k, k minus 1 k minus 2 over 3 factorial x cubed, and so on. So let's try this when k is a third. We have 1 plus uh, 1 third x plus uh, 1 third and then k minus 1 is a negative 2 thirds. Um, for the next one, we've got a third, negative 2 thirds, negative 5 thirds. Let's see, for this next one, so we have 1 plus a third x. Now I'm just going to kind of try to simplify. Um, I'm going to try to simplify these coefficients in a way that, that makes it easier to recognize a pattern, or easiest to, to recognize a pattern. Um, so first of all, this will be negative. I'm going to have a fraction. I've got, uh, on top, I'll have a 2. On the bottom, I have 3 squared, 2 factorial. x squared. And then, see, our next term will be a positive again. I've got my 3 factorial. Uh, let's see, in the bottom of this fraction, we're going to have 3 cubed. And then up top is 2 times 5. 
And I'm going to leave it as 2 times 5 instead of writing it as 10. Um, let's see, what would the next one be? I didn't, I didn't, you know, we didn't lay it out um, in the line above, but I think we can do some pattern recognition here. First, it'll be a negative, and the denominator will be 3 to the 4th, 4 factorial. And we have x to the fourth. And then what's on top? So our next our next factor, like right here, would be a negative eight thirds. So I'd, I'd end up with another factor that's three more than this highest factor in the previous term. So two times five times eight. Then we could even just do one more for good measure. Um, so the bottom will be three to the fifth times five factorial, x to the fifth. Up top, two, five, 8, 11. So, and I think that's a, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good progress here. Um, and just, you know, we've established a pattern, and I'm just going to leave it written like that. Um, we've established enough of a pattern that the reader could tell what the next uh, terms in this series are going to be. All right. Um, all right. So now uh, we're going to finish up this section by finding a power series for sine squared of x, and we really want to do it in a way that does not require us to multiply two series together. Um, that's difficult and cumbersome, and often the best we could do is just figure out the first few non-zero terms um, if we're trying to multiply two series together. So. Um, we want to, um, you know, try to find, be able to actually write this series for sine squared x, um, and we want to do it with the least amount of work necessary. So um, we're going to employ the use of the half angle identity here, the half angle identity for sine. It says that sine squared x is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2x all over 2. Um, and I'm going to just split up this fraction, so we have 1 half minus 1 half cosine 2x. So now we have something more useful uh, to focus on. Um, let's get a series for cosine 2x and use that. All right, so cosine x, we've, we've already used this series uh, in a previous uh, example. So the cosine series, it's alternating, and then we have even powers of x. So that means cosine of 2x. I'm just going to replace x with 2x. Okay, um, maybe we can simplify this a little bit. 2x to the 2n is 2 to the 2n times x to the 2n. So that's our series. for cosine 2x. So sine squared x is 1 half minus 1 half times this series. Um, and, you know, so we could stop here, or we could absorb this factor of one-half inside the series. It 
If we do that, we'll have an extra factor of 2 in the denominator. And then I'm just going to simplify here. So we have 2 to the 2n minus 1, x to the 2n over 2n factorial, and of course alternating. So there's our series. All right, uh, so we finished chapter 5. Um, this is the, the end of the material. It'll be on the test on infinite series. Um, please do spend some time on the exercises, reach out with questions, and um, I'll see you on Zoom.